Hi, it's Jeff, host of the podcast. Imagine a world where planning your books is as fun as writing them, where plotters plot in heroic harmony and pantsers organize without overwhelm. Here's the thing, that world exists. Plotters and pantsers alike love the visual outlining and story Bible software Plotter, now available both online and as a web app. Named the number one outlining app for productivity by Kindlepreneur, Plotter turns outlining and organizing your books into the creative process it's supposed to be. Visit Plotter.com today. That's P-L-O-T-T-R dot com today and experience the difference yourself. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Bianca Murray, author of the new novel, The Witches of Moonshine Manor. Author Susan Wiggs wrote about the novel, richly imagined, gorgeously written, and completely addictive. This exuberant novel is a celebration of womanhood at its brightest, funniest, most honest, and most kind. Bianca has written the kind of insightful, empowering story you can't wait to share with a friend. Bianca, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. It's so lovely to be here. And isn't that the most lovely blurb that Susan wrote? I just, I love, I love hearing that. <laughs> it is, it is. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your novel, The Witches of Moonshine Manor, how would you describe the novel? Yeah, the, the novel is kind of contemporary fantasy. It's about six octogenarian witches who, you know, are facing huge challenges because they the only home that they've that they've ever known is Moonshine Manor and it's their livelihood as well because they run a distillery from there and uh, they've fallen behind on their payments and the townsmen are coming for them as they have been coming for them for decades to try and kick them out of their home and they are now having to fight back for their home and fight for each other. And it's a fun, madcap romp of a book. Um, I, I was really hoping that readers would just fly through it and just laugh and just really, really enjoy the, the adventures of the sisterhood. That's wonderful. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write The Witches of Moonshine Manor? Yes, so character always comes to me first, Jeff, before plot does. And two characters came to me, these women who were in their 80s, who had been lifelong friends. Um, one of them had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and was starting to lose herself as she lost the memories of herself. And that fascinated me because, you know, so much of our, our identity is tied into how we remember ourselves when we were younger, through our lives. And when those memories go and the memories go of who our network is, who our friends are, who our families are, then how do we hang on to our identities? Um, and what can those, what can the people who love us do to remind us of, of who we are? And that was my, you know, that was the first thing I thought of. But then I thought, okay, that's going to be quite a serious book. And I really wanted to write something fun because I was writing it during COVID and the world was already a very dark place. And so it came to me that I could turn this into a witchy novel, have an ensemble cast um, with, you know, more of a, a fun element to it while still looking at the important things like aging, ageism, identity, et cetera. Um, and, and it just took off from there. And I'm curious, what was your writing process when you were working on The Witches of Moonshine Manor? Are you someone who outlines your novels extensively, or did you just dive into the, into the narrative? Yeah, I'm a terrible, terrible plotter. You know, they say writers are plotters or pantsers. Um, and when I'm teaching creative writing and on the podcast, I'm always saying to people, you really should plot because it's going to make your life so much easier. You're not going to write yourself into a corner and have to rewrite. Uh, but I'm terrible at taking my own advice. And so I struggle with plotting a whole novel because I write to find out what's going to happen. And as soon as I know what's going to happen, I have zero 
zero desire to explore that. So I just sat down every single day with these, you know, this ensemble cast. And, you know, for me in life and in literature, character is revealed through adversity. When people are going through tough times, when they are overcoming obstacles, that is when our true nature is really revealed. And so, you know, I like to take my characters, I torture them a bit because that makes for good literature. I have terrible things happening to them. And then I say to them, okay, now get yourself out of this bind. Let's see what you're going to do. And I let them run with it. So I, you know, I try and know what I'm going to do on a scene by scene basis. But beyond that, the headlights only extend so far. And I just trust in these characters to to take me a place where I where I want to be. That's great. And I'm curious, what was your initial fiction writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? So I wrote two novels before my debut was published. Uh, they were both equally bad and rejected by everyone, which I was absolutely devastated about at the time. But in hindsight, I realized why that happened. Um, but, you know, those first two novels weren't personal. They weren't important. They weren't passion projects for me. They were just books that I was writing and having fun with. And so, you know, I didn't even revise them. I finished them. I made the big mistake of sending them off to agents. Um, I even got some decent feedback, which I then didn't even use in terms of the rewrites. And when it came to my third book, which was my debut book that was published, it was a very personal story. It was something that meant a lot to me. And I really wanted to see that story go out into the world. And so, you know, I landed an agent with that book. We revised, we went out on submission. The book got rejected 50 times by editors. I got a lot of feedback. I was told I'd been way too ambitious in terms of the scope of the project. The book spanned sort of three decades. Um, and, you know, the editors suggested that I pick a period of time in the character's life and focus on that. So to that end, I took out 60,000 words and started again. And even then, you know, the novel was then rejected another 49 times before the 50th editor fell in love with it um, and, and offered to publish it. So, you know, when I speak to emerging writers, I understand their frustration. I understand how difficult it is how, you know, how you get all of these rejections and you just want to give up. And that's why I say, you know, write something you're passionate about that you're not prepared to give up on, that you can polish and polish and, and make it as good as you possibly can so that it stands a much better chance of being published. You co-host your own podcast about writing uh, called The Shit No One Tells You About Writing. What can you tell us about the podcast? Yeah. So, you know, again, during COVID, everything was shut down. I had a summer that was supposed to be full of things to do. Um, and that thing got canceled along with everyone else in the world's plans. And I had been teaching creative writing um, up until then, full circle moment. I was once a student at the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies studying creative writing. And after I published my first two novels, I then became a creative writing instructor there. And, you know, I realized that I was reaching just a handful of students. And I also realized that not everyone can afford to pay for a course like this. Um, and I had a lot of people reaching out along the way, asking for writing advice. And I found myself repeating the same things over and over. And I thought, how can I reach a wider audience? How can I, you know, instruct people on the business of writing, the craft of writing, on everything they need to know, without them having to spend money um, and just reach a wider audience. And that's how I began, you know, the shit no one tells you about writing. And within six months, I had two amazing literary agents join me as co-hosts, Carly Waters and Cece Lira. And they began critiquing uh, query letters and opening pages so that writers could really polish their work before sending it out into the world. And um you know, and, and that's just really taken off. And it's just been incredibly rewarding to have people email us and say, you critiqued our work. I was able to polish it up. I sent it out. I managed to get an agent. Um, and that's just, you know, that I, I celebrate for each and every one of them because it's just, it's just so wonderful. 
That's wonderful. And I'm wondering, can you tell us about your own voices initiative that you created or started? Yes. So so my first two novels were about um, being raised as a white child in South Africa, being pretty much brainwashed to be racist, which is, you know, what the apartheid regime did. It took children from a very young age, told them that they were this exalted race and they could treat black people terribly. And, um, you know, you grow up with that kind of mindset. It's really difficult to break out of that. It takes a lot of work to, one, admit your racism, two, to unpack it, and three, to commit to doing better all the time. And so those two novels were about, you know, the um, the the power dynamic, the shift that happens in a country where people are so blatantly racist and one race is just, you know, treated so absolutely awfully. Um, and so from in both of those novels, I wrote from the perspective of black characters because I wanted to do a 360 view of racism. Otherwise, I would just be writing from these privileged white people's perspectives and you wouldn't see the impact that that kind of racism has on other people. And so I wrote from black characters' perspectives. And after that, you know, I um, had many conversations with black authors in South Africa who were really frustrated by the fact that they were trying to write these stories, but they weren't getting published internationally. Um, And, you know, I said to myself, I don't want to be a part of that problem. I don't want my stories to be published stopping people who've lived this experience getting to tell their own stories. And so I started the Eunice Ngogordo Own Voices Initiative. She was my childhood caregiver. Um, She is the person that my books have been dedicated to. You know, she just has inspired me throughout my life. She actually turned 99 this year and I managed to visit her in South Africa. Um, But that initiative is aimed to empower young black women to be able to tell their own stories, to be able to study writing, and to find a platform whereby their stories can be published. Venture X from Capital One is the travel card for people always asking, where next? You earn 10x miles on hotels and rental cars, and 5x miles on flights booked through Capital One Travel, and 2x miles on everything else you buy with Venture X. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. Tis the season for super fast internet. In fact, tis always the season for super fast internet. Switch to Frontier Fiber One gig service for upload speeds 25 times faster than cable. And with our whole home Wi-Fi guarantee, we'll make sure everyone's new devices work in every room. All for just $59.99 a month with AutoPay. Plus, get a $200 Visa reward card on us. Uncable yourself. Get fiber internet from Frontier. Go to Frontier.com slash Fast2 for complete offer terms, eligibility, and service performance details. Speak lane based on competitor advertised speeds and market. Service is subject to availability. It only happens once a year. JCPenney's cyber deals are back in-store and at jcp.com. Through Wednesday, fill your cart with deals like Yes Please Diamonds and Gemstones now $19.99 each. Or use your coupon inside the JCP app to save up to 50% on small appliances and cookware from top brands like Keurig, Cuisinart, Calphalon, and more. We got your holiday. JCPenney offers good on select items through 1130. Exclusions apply. Jewelry excluded from coupons. See store or jcp.com for details. That's wonderful. And as you mentioned earlier, you you have this podcast where you critique writers' works and give writing advice. But I'm curious, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Yeah, you know, it's one is just give yourself permission to tell the story. I think one of the biggest things that I come up against with new writers, emerging writers, is the sense of imposter syndrome. They have the sense, who am I to think I can write a novel? Who am I to think anyone will be interested in anything I have to say? How can I say anything original that hasn't been said before? And I say to writers, you know, we our whole lives we are going to deal with criticism. When our work gets published, it gets reviewed professionally. People read it and they go on to Goodreads. You know, it is constant critique. People either love it or they hate it. And so for us to become our own worst critics is just, it's counterintuitive and it's, it's cruel and you cannot create anything while you are critiquing yourself and being critical of your own work. So for me, that's the biggest thing. Just 
Stop that voice in your head that is constantly telling you you're not good enough. Silence that voice. Sit down. Bum in chair. There is no secret to writing. Many people, you know, hope that they can get some nugget of wisdom that'll unlock the key for them. But really, all it is, is sitting down, making time for your work and writing. And often the first things you write are going to be awful. First drafts are meant to be awful. Look at them for what they are. Tell the story to yourself and then sit down and start polishing and making it better. That's great. Well, what books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, gosh, there are so many because I read, you know, all the books for my podcast ahead of interviewing authors. So I'm generally reading five or six books at any given point. My favorites of the last while, I absolutely adored Still Life by uh, Sarah Winman. She is one of my favorite authors going back to her first novel, When God Was a Rabbit. I, I just adored that novel. Um, you know, there, there's... Deanna Rayborn has come out with uh, Killers of a Certain Age, which is kind of similar to The Witches of Moonshine Manor in that it's women in their 60s who are assassins, um, and it's an exploration of women aging into their power, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, I love Lessons in Chemistry uh, that came out a little while ago. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, my list is extensive, Jeff. I could wax lyrical for <laughs> ages. Um, and, you know, having become a writer, I just appreciate books so much more because I was always a voracious reader. First and foremost, I was a reader. It was my love of reading that made me want to become a writer. Um, and, you know, now that I understand the craft, I can really sit there and just have my mind blown by the enormous talent of so many of these authors. That's wonderful. So are you working on a new novel now? I started two different novels, um, which I've kind of put on hold because I realized that I need to commit to a genre. You know, the problem is my first two novels were very literary books. Um, they were much more serious. And now I've done this madcap romp of a book um, that celebrates diversity and aging disgracefully and all of these things. Um, and then I also put out an Audible original, which was quite a serious dystopian um, story. And then the other two I was writing, one was a psychological thriller and one was another more serious book. And I've said to myself, okay, you are just going to confuse your readers <laughs> who will look at your name and go, we have no idea what we're getting from this author at this point. I feel like only you know, some authors like Margaret Atwood can get away with that kind of thing. Um, so I'm waiting to see sort of how The Witches of Moonshine Manor does commercially. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, if it does well, that that will inform, you know, the kind of genre that I should be doing going forward. But I do, I have a ton of ideas um, and I'm looking forward to getting back to writing. But as you know, Jeff, podcasting is time consuming. <laughs> it's it's a lot of work. It is, you know? so, it is. People don't realize the work that goes into it. And so, you know, the podcast takes up about four days of my week. So I'm just, I'm trying to find a bit of balance at the moment to dedicate to that and to my writing. Sure. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novel? Right. So I have a website, Um, There's so much fun content on that for the Witches of Moonshine Manor. There's a Which Witch Are You quiz to find out which character you are. Uh, there's a Wordle, a witchy Wordle on that. There's the Witches floor plans of, of their manor and there's a playlist and all kinds of things there. Um, there's, you know, there's also the services that I offer to writers um, as well. And if they're interested in the podcast, the website is the shitaboutwriting.com. Um, we've got an amazing virtual retreat coming up in September where we have 14 phenomenal authors who will be speaking at that retreat. Um, and, you know, if people are interested, they can also go there and, and have a look at how to sign up for that. That's wonderful. Well, again, we've been speaking with Bianca Murray, author of the new novel, The Witches of Moonshine Manor. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Bianca, thanks for doing this interview. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. It's been such a joy chatting with you. Thank you for taking the time. Wonderful. Saturday, October 23rd, morning. Half an hour before the alarm will be sounded for the first time in decades, 
drawing four frantic old women and a geriatric crow from all corners of the sprawling manor. Ursula is awoken by insistent knocking, like giant knuckles rapping against glass. It's an ominous sign, to be sure, the first of many. Trying to rid herself of the sticky cobwebs of sleep, Ursula throws back the covers, groaning as her joints loudly voice their displeasure. She slept in the buff, as is her usual habit, and as she pads across the room, she's more naked than the day she was born, being, as she is, one of those rare babies who came into the world fully encased in a call. Upon reaching the window, the cause of the ruckus is immediately obvious to Ursula. One of the angel oak's sturdy branches is thumping against her third-floor window. Strong winds whip through the tree, making it shimmy and shake, giving the impression that it's espousing the old adage to dance like no one's watching, a quality that rather has to be admired in a tree. Either that, or it's trembling uncontrollably with fear. The forest, encroaching at the garden's boundary, looks disquieted. It hangs its head low, bowing to a master who's ordered it to bend the knee. As the charcoal sky churns, not a bird to be seen, the trees in the wood whisper incessantly. Whether they're secrets or warnings, Ursula can't tell, which only unsettles her further. That infernal billboard that the city recently erected across from the manor property, with its aggressive, gigantic lettering shouting, Critchety Hackle Mega Complex Coming Soon! snaps in the wind, issuing small cracks of thunder. A storm is on its way. That much is clear. You don't need to have Ivy's particular powers to know as much. Turning her back on the ominous view, Ursula heads for the calendar to mark off another mostly sleepless night. It seems impossible that after so many of them, night upon night, strung up after each other seemingly endlessly, only two remain until Ruby's return, upon which Ursula will discover her fate. Either Ruby knows, or she doesn't. And if she does know, there's the chance that she'll want nothing more to do with Ursula. The thought makes her breath hitch, the accompanying stab of pain almost too much to bear. The best she can hope for under the circumstances is that Ruby will forgive her releasing Ursula from the invisible prison her guilt has sentenced her to. Too preoccupied with thoughts of Ruby to remember to don her robe, Ursula takes a seat at her mahogany escritoire. She lights a cone of mugwort and sweet laurel incense, watching as the tendril of smoke unfurls, inscribing itself upon the air. Inhaling the sweet scent, she picks up a purple silk pouch and unties it, spilling the contents onto her palm. The tarot cards are all frayed around the edges, worn down from countless hours spent jostling through Ursula's hands. Despite their shabbiness, they crackle with electricity, sparks flying as she shuffles them. After cutting the deck in three, Ursula begins laying the cards down, one after the other, on top of the heptagram she carved into the writing desk's surface almost 80 years ago. The first card, placed in the center, is the tower. Unfortunate souls tumble from the top of a fortress that's been struck by lightning, flames engulfing it. Ursula experiences a jolt of alarm at the sight of it, for the tower has to signify the manor, and anything threatening their home threatens them all. The second card, placed above the first at the one o'clock position, can only represent Tabitha, It's the Ten of Swords, depicting a person lying face down with ten swords buried in their back. The last time Ursula saw the card, she'd made a mental note to make an appointment with her acupuncturist. But now, following so soon after the tower, it makes her shift nervously. The third, fourth, and fifth cards, placed at the three o'clock, four-thirty, and six o'clock positions, depict a person, who must be Queenie, struggling under too heavy a load. A heart pierced by swords, signifying Ursula, and a horned beast towering above a man and woman who are shackled together, obviously Jezebel.
Tis the season for super fast internet. In fact, tis always the season for super fast internet. Switch to Frontier Fiber One gig service for upload speeds 25 times faster than cable. And with our whole home Wi-Fi guarantee, we'll make sure everyone's new devices work in every room. All for just $59.99 a month with AutoPay. Plus, get a $200 Visa reward card on us. Uncable yourself. Get fiber internet from Frontier. Go to Frontier.com slash Fast2 for complete offer terms, eligibility, and service performance details. Speed claim based on competitor advertised speeds and markets. Service is subject to availability. It only happens once a year. JCPenney's cyber deals are back in store and at jcp.com. Through Wednesday, fill your cart with deals like Yes Please Diamonds and Gemstones now $19.99 each. Or use your coupon inside the JCP app to save up to 50% on small appliances and cookware from top brands like Keurig, Cuisinart, Calphalon, and more. We got your holiday. JCPenney offers good on select items through 1130. Exclusions apply. Jewelry excluded from coupons. See store or jcp.com for details. Wander Middle-Earth in the Lore of the Rings podcast, where we wander the world of J.R.R. Tolkien. In the Lore of the Rings podcast, we explore the inspiring tales and rich mythology of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings Legendaria, and connect it to the movies and the new Rings of Power series. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more, you'll find a new lore-packed episode every Thursday. Come wander and not be lost with the Lore of the Rings podcast.